4. New educational settings. The different situations that result from the social and cultural changes occurring in the latter part of the 20th century require a new evangelization and therefore different educational settings. The acute social awareness of so much injustice, an awareness created in the Institute after the Second Vatican Council, causes a series of educational actions to spring up as a response. The backdrop to all of these efforts, which attempt to respond to the difficulties modern society now offers, is our reparative charism. General Congregation 11 broadened in a notable way our apostolic and pastoral activities. The Institute feels the urgent need to make itself present wherever there are signs of brokenness and death. New challenges urge us to be signs of the love and mercy of the heart of Christ. In all circumstances to encourage a closeness to the poor and marginalized, a privileged position for the Lord to be present in, to commit ourselves to work for justice and to denounce structural sin from the place in which we live and work. In regard to formal education, we have seen how the centers that already existed have gone through a process of progressive democratization. Of the 23 schools that were created between 1965 and 2001, all but five were established in areas of greater need, in order to meet the needs of immigrants, indigenous peoples, gypsy populations, children with special needs, and so on. Education in these centers has opened and continues to open doors to a more complete formation of the whole person for many students. In Latin America, a very interesting path was opened for us, one that enabled us to broaden our educational ministry, the Fee Y Alegria Faith and Joe Schools. This intercongregational undertaking, created by the Society of Jesus in order to offer education to the working class and established in many Latin American countries, has allowed us to operate seven schools in Colombia, Ecuador, Bolivia and Peru, and to be able to collaborate in the pilot program for education via radio in Santa Cruz, Bolivia, which is a work of the same organization. The Institute recognizes the importance of formal education, but current situations of injustice, contemplated serenely in the light of the gospel and the new directives of the church, call us to respond to different needs. Our mission of evangelization transcends the walls of our schools in order to be integrated into a much broader pastoral ministry. Furthermore, we observe that the most recent general congregations encourage us to express a spirit of love for the church, which was so deeply rooted in our foundresses, not only through communion, but also through an attitude of availability, lending our service and collaboration to church barjacks and underachings at the universal, diocesan, and parish levels. Throughout this time period 42 communities were founded as inserted ministries and entrusted with the role of becoming incarnate in the zone where they carry out their mission, adapting their way of life to that of the people whom they are to evangelize, and always showing themselves open to them in a true spirit of service. In this way, inserted communities are called to work, discern, and make the handmaids present in their neighborhoods, sharing our hope with the people there, experiencing their problems firsthand, so that we may grow in solidarity and become agents of the tender love of God. Our solidarity with the people's aspirations for liberation, how we are helping them to become aware of their situation, how as handmaids, we promote their dignity and rights, how we are working so that they themselves might become agents of their own history. Implementing our charism, our communities carry out, in collaboration with the local church, very diverse pastoral ministries and non-formal educational outreach. The promotion of women, literacy campaigns, daycare centers, school tutoring, education and service of the gospel in indigenous and rural areas, after-school activities, drug and alcohol rehabilitation, prison ministry, defense of human rights, clinics, welcome centers, and more. Good examples of this among many include our communities of Font da Prada Portugal, Canite de los Torres Spain, Tibertillo Italy, Barrio Nuvo and Las Tunas Argentina, Roja India Sacuisli Ecuador. The scope of activities is broad, because there is so much brokenness to be repaired in humankind, and our charism urges us to work for justice in love. Our most recent general congregation launches us even further into the deep, when it spurs us to act creatively in education in service of the gospel in the world of the poor and the weakest. This calls us to emphasize certain aspects of our task. Renew our commitment to ensuring that our apostolic action, in whatever place or work we may be, affects the lives of the poorest and those who are excluded, and contributes to the transformation of unjust structures. The apostolate of catechesis has expanded notably in these years, not only because of our collaboration in parish catechism programs for children, youth, 
and adults, but also because of the number of sisters who give religion classes in more than 25 state schools. It can be said that in the majority of our communities, there is participation in this mission that was so beloved by our foundresses, who never allowed any occasion to transmit the faith to those whom they encountered to pass them by. It is easily understandable that this significant apostolic growth has demanded of the Institute a great effort of enculturation in various environments. Since this is identified with the process of evangelization of every culture and subculture, in a dialogue in which faith seeks its authentic expression in the culture which it is addressing. The most recent general congregations are also insistent in this point. We should become incarnate in each culture, like Jesus Christ himself, who became a man of his time, in a particular context, which he loved and accepted fully. Ask ourselves whether we are proclaiming the gospel in the language of the people verbal expression, symbolism customs positive values. Allow ourselves to be enriched by their faith and spirituality. In order to transmit the light and strength of faith, we need a stance of dialogue with and listening to the society which we are called to evangelize. Looking toward the future, we have to continue to fine-tune our awareness of all the needs to which our education and service of the gospel now calls our attention, knowing, as our foundress is new, that we can count on the presence of the Lord. I am with you. Five, lay involvement. We have seen in the third chapter how the Institute incorporated laypersons into our educational works prior to 1950. Vatican II, in its decree Apostolicam Actuositatum, opened to laypersons new and unexpected possibilities in the apostolate when it recognized and confirmed that the mission of evangelization belongs to all Christians. Since then, communion and collaboration with laypersons has become an essential criterion for the development of our education. Gravissimum Educationist speaks in a special way to their apostolic mission in this field, seeing it as the work of a single body. Beautiful indeed and of great importance is the vocation of all those who aid parents in fulfilling their duties and who, as representatives of the human community, undertake the task of education in schools. This vocation demands special qualities of mind and heart, very careful preparation, and continuing readiness to renew and to adapt. The Council reminds them of the greatness of their task. The work of these teachers, this sacred synod declares, is in the real sense of the word an apostolate most suited to and necessary for our times and at once a true service offered to society. Echoing the theological development of the Church, the Institute promotes with ever greater enthusiasm the integration of laypersons into our apostolic works. One very necessary thing for the action of the laity to be effective in the service of fostering Christian life is for all of us to consider them as authentic collaborators in our apostolate, for as the constitution on the church states, a great many wonderful things for the church to be hoped for from this familiar interaction between the laity and religious, in the laity a strengthened sense of personal responsibility. This collaboration is progressively concretized and broadened, especially after General Congregation 11, in which the educational community is discussed for the first time. The General Congregation asks that each member of the educational community be given the responsibility and authority necessary to carry out his or her role. Teachers, of course, have a key role in the educational community, since they are the professionals in the field of education. The parents' associations are also very important in our centers. The participation of parents varies, just as the reality of the different contexts in which we carry out our educational activity varies. Nevertheless there is a common awareness of the importance of collaboration among parents and educators in this shared mission in order to form an educational community, which can become in turn a community of faith, although this latter can in some cases be difficult to achieve. Despite the difficulties, in one way or another, parents are involved in every one of our centers. In the opening talk of the first Latin American Conference of Handmade Education held in Cochabamba, SR, Rosario Leo remarks, in this moment in which the Church appends a great deal on laypersons for its new evangelization, it is a joy for us to be here among so many lay collaborators who share with us our interest and concern for an education that is not only Christian and promotes integration, but an education according to our charism. In the same way, Sister Rita Burley will address the teachers of Spain who are gathered in Cordoba. In the epoch of St. Rafael Maria, all of the teachers were handmaids, Currently, the majority of the faculty of our centers is made up of lay personnel. 
if she were to see us today, lay teachers and handmaids together, what would Saint Raphael and Maria say to us? I think that, gazing upon us with affection and interest, she would say that she is pleased that we work in communion, joying forces, in an attitude of collaboration, and the exchange of gifts. She would say that she counts on us to make one of her deepest ideals a reality, that of education in service of the gospel, centered in the Eucharist, in our case, in Spain of the Third Mill. General Congregation 16 underscores the importance of laypeople even further, calling them a true gift for the Institute. We are working more and more with laypeople in ministry at parochial and diocesan levels, as well as in our own apostolic works. The laity bring us the richness of their own vocation, an authentic gift which harmonizes with our religious vocation and complements it. Together we live out a common mission in the Church. Saint Raphael and Maria desired her institute to be a united family, and now it opens its arms to all those who wish to share its spirit and mission. The ACI family will be a new expression of communion, of this walking together with lay people. Not long afterwards, General Congregation 17, upon posing the question, where is God leading us, says that one of the profound desires of the General Congregation is that everyone, handmaids and lay people, be called to transform the world, living the same charism from complementary vocations in order to carry out the common mission that the Institute, in the name of the Church, has entrusted to us. Today, the role of lay collaborators is not limited to teaching, but includes ever greater administrative tasks, as the congregation tries out new leadership and administrative structures in our centers in different countries, new ways that will guarantee that our schools continue to be centers of education in service of the gospel. Until relatively recently, it was a frequent occurrence to find a good number of handmaids working in each school. In our days, even if there were sufficient vocations, such a concentration could still be a mistake. This is not because of convenience or the demands of necessity, but rather to enable the Institute to extend its mission even further to respond to the needs that clamor in the church and in society. For this reason, it is ever more necessary that our lay teachers share our charism totally. Many already form part of the ACI family and are extending our outreach. This obliges us to foster their formation in our specific values so that they may know our spirituality better and discover more deeply their own vocation in the church. Some things which already express this reality and are contributing to the creation of a family atmosphere are the different gatherings for pastoral ministry and for formation which are being held in the institute at the national, provincial, and international levels, attended by laypeople and handmaids. All of us, handmaids and laity, are called to transform the world, to live the same charism from complementary vocations in order to carry out the common mission that the Institute, in the name of the Church, has entrusted to us. 6. A Hope-Filled Future In order to be faithful to today and to construct tomorrow, it is necessary to lay deep foundations, and thereby continue responding with creative fidelity to our charism because this legacy becomes part of history through the family of the handmaids of the Sacred Heart. However, it is not only for the handmaids. We have received it as a precious inheritance for the entire world. Our task is to deepen it and allow it to flow freely so that it becomes the patrimony of all. The signs of the times are crying out to us that only those who take risks and go forth will continue to have a place in history. GC13 has already encouraged us to rediscover and bring to life in the Institute the evangelizing power in our charism, and for this reason proposes that, at the level of government, we plan and evaluate our apostolic works, taking into account our own situation and the needs of our world. This planning is necessary so that all of us can live every aspect of our mission faithfully and joyfully, in such a way that it attracts and challenges those to whom we address our message. This journey is made manifest to us today with new force, but also with humble historical realism. We have lost prestige, privileges, security. We became aware of the diminished number of sisters, the few vocations in the majority of the provinces, works that overwhelm us now that we are fewer and with less strength, but we saw this with peace, with hope, with joy, because we also felt strongly that the Lord had led the Institute and continued to lead it through the paths by which He wants to guide us. In this same letter, Sister Rosario Leo spoke of the need to carry out a planning and restructuring of the communities and apostolic works at the Institute level, which will be promoted by the general government in order to see where we are and how we are, 
and if this is where and how the Lord wants us to be, or if there are other calls from the church and from today's world to which we should respond. At this crossroad, at the beginning of the third millennium, the Institute opens itself anew to the innovative power of the Spirit present in our foundational charism and wants to overcome inertia in structures and customs. General Congregation 16 saw clearly that our decisions cannot have as their first objective the prolongation of our past, but must instead give answers creatively, from our foundational charism, to the demands of the present and thereby prepare for and anticipate an immediate future full of promise. Important decisions are not made without pain even the tree suffers from the act of pruning, but it is the only way to continue growing with vigor. Our educational institutions have no reason to be exactly what they were 20 or 30 years ago. We are not talking about change, for the sake of change, but rather seeking new paths and new forms in which the Institute may offer greater and better service to humanity and to the Church. Upon beginning the joint planning of the four provinces of Spain, Sister Rita Burley, Superior General, wrote, This planning does not seek only to restructure works and communities but rather to rethink the way of carrying out our mission in Spain, in order to give it more life, better service to the Church and the world, and also to allow us to live our vocations with more joy, sacrifice, and peace. What is new and beautiful is to carry out this search together. For this reason we will grow in our listening to what God is showing us, and we will allow ourselves to be led by Him with trust. The Institute journeys toward the future with hope, we are like navigators who have neither well-worn pathways to follow, nor routes with signposts, but stay afloat, and, if they arrive safely in port, if they survive, it is because they do not give up. Such as these sail even into dark and cloud-laden horizons. We know that something new is springing up and that the Lord, always faithful, will continue to lead us with His tenderness and mercy. We have as well another great certainty. The knowledge that our building is constructed upon the heroic sanctity of Raphael Maria. Chapter 5. Fidelity to our Identity and Mission 1. Education is Reparation The Institute's mission of education begins with its foundation in 1877. From that point on, being educators is clearly an essential part of our identity and mission. Mother Sacred Heart and Mother Pillar passed on to us our mission of reparation, which has characterized our educational activity from the beginning and continues to do so today, and although, Rafaela Maria never defined the charism of reparation or left us a completed treatise on it. She left us much more. She left us her very life. She bequeathed us her spiritual experience, which transcends all time periods and cultures because it is permeated by the mystery of God. The reason behind her apostolic urgency was clear. Reparation to the sacred heart of Jesus and the concern of his heart for the salvation of souls. The foundresses were women incarnated in a specific history in a particular moment, and when they contemplated the love of the Sacred Heart, they did so from the context of their own time. They were able to discern what God was asking of them, their participation in the saving love of Christ. In Christ, that love was felt in the deepest part of their being as the water that flows freely from the spring, not in order to be dammed up, but rather to spread far and wide and be poured out, in order to give life to others, and thereby transform the society of their time by means of education in service of the gospel, so that all may know and love him. That dynamism within the charism, which is expressed today in so many forms in the Institute, is born of a life that is totally centered in the Eucharistic Christ. We live reparation to the heart of Jesus by participating in the fullness of the Eucharistic mystery. Our mission, centered in the celebration of the Eucharist, has as characteristic expressions. Adoration of Christ present in the Eucharist, Apostolic Activity of Education in Service of the Gospel From the beginnings, education was experienced in the Institute as a form of reparation, of giving life in order to enable growth, making it possible for persons to relate to God, to others, and with themselves in a new way. In the first writings, education is always linked to reparation and appears as an expression of the manifestation of the love of the heart of Jesus, the one to whom this service is offered. Mother Sacred Heart regards with a profound gaze the students who are the beneficiaries of so much effort and work, she sees each of them as God's handiwork. As soon as you become joyful again, you will like everything, and you will look at the children especially, not as the impertinent little beings which they are by nature, 
but with the interest with which one looks at something very precious, for each soul has cost the blood of God himself. Whatever you do for them, our Lord receives as done to him. Pray much for them to the sacred heart, and concern yourself about them as members of his body. Therefore she encourages and recognizes the greatness of the task of those who are dedicated to the mission of education, a task always simple and always new, which must be forged anew with every new historical situation, and with every new life, because the person before us is always unique and irreplaceable. I am very glad to hear the good news that you are working with the little ones, trying to be an apostle and a mother to them. Love this holy work very much. From the vantage point of a contemplative gaze upon a world broken by sin, and from an enthusiastic love of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist, the Institute continues to feel today the call to persevere in the work of education in service of the gospel begun by the foundresses, a call which commits us to work joyfully as educators. Called by Christ to communion with him in his life and mission, we strive to continue his work of salvation. Contemplating a world broken by sin impels us to proclaim the liberation brought about by the gospel, and thus to work towards the realization of the new order in Christ. As we have already seen, the foundresses wanted to give a concrete response, springing from God, to the challenges of those calamitous times, and nothing was better suited to that end than offering an education inspired by the values of the gospel, which would serve to counteract the evil and corrupting teaching that was causing so much damage. In the first school rules we read, being one of the means which the Institute employs in order to attain the end proposed, which is reparation of the offenses done to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, free education to poor girls, promoting by this means at the same time, the good of souls of those most in need, should be held in great esteem, by all those who are called to this congregation, so much so that it should not be omitted except for very serious reasons, but rather they should endeavor that day, by day it increases. Part 2. Our Philosophy of Education. Chapter 5. Fidelity to Our Identity and Mission. 1. Education is Reparation. The Institute's mission of education begins with its foundation in 1877. From that point on, being educators is clearly an essential part of our identity and mission. Mother Sacred Heart and Mother Pillar passed on to us our mission of reparation which has characterized our educational activity from the beginning and continues to do so today, and although Rafaela Maria never defined the charism of reparation or left us a completed treatise on it, she left us much more, she left us her very life, she bequeathed us her spiritual experience, which transcends all time periods and cultures because it is permeated by the mystery of God. The reason behind her apostolic urgency was clear, reparation to the sacred heart of Jesus, and the concern of his heart for the salvation of souls, the foundresses were women incarnated in a specific history, in a particular moment, and when they contemplated the love of the sacred heart, they did so from the context of their own time. They were able to discern what God was asking of them, their participation in the saving love of Christ. In Christ, that love was felt in the deepest part of their being as the water that flows freely from the spring, not in order to be dammed up, but rather to spread far and wide and be poured out, in order to give life to others, and thereby transform the society of their time, by means of education in service of the gospel, so that all may know and love him. That dynamism within the charism, which is expressed today in so many forms in the Institute, is born of a life that is totally centered in the Eucharistic Christ. We live reparation to the heart of Jesus, by participating in the fullness of the Eucharistic mystery. Our mission, centered in the celebration of the Eucharist, has as characteristic expressions. Adoration of Christ present in the Eucharist. Apostolic activity of education in service of the Gospel. From the beginnings, education was experienced in the Institute as a form of reparation, of giving life in order to enable growth, making it possible for persons to relate to God, to others, and with themselves in a new way. In the first writings, education, is always linked to reparation and appears as an expression of the manifestation of the love of the heart of Jesus, the one to whom this service is offered. Mother Sacred Heart regards with a profound gaze the students who are the beneficiaries of so much effort and work, she sees each of them as God's handiwork. As soon as you become joyful again, you will like everything, and you will look at the children, especially, not as the impertinent little beings which they are by nature, 
but with the interest with which one looks at something very precious, for each soul has cost the blood of God himself. Whatever you do for them, our Lord receives as done to him. Pray much for them to the sacred heart, and concern yourself about them as members of his body. Therefore she encourages and recognizes the greatness of the task of those who are dedicated to the mission of education, a task always simple and always new, which must be forged anew with every new historical situation, and with every new life, because the person before us is always unique and irreplaceable. I am very glad to hear the good news that you are working with the little ones, trying to be an apostle and a mother to them. Love this holy work very much. From the vantage point of a contemplative gaze upon a world broken by sin, and from an enthusiastic love of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist, the Institute continues to feel today, the call to persevere in the work of education in service of the gospel begun by the foundresses, a call which commits us to work joyfully as educators. Called by Christ to communion with him in his life and mission, we strive to continue his work of salvation. Contemplating a world broken by sin impels us to proclaim the liberation brought about by the gospel, and thus to work towards the realization of the new order in Christ. As we have already seen, the foundresses wanted to give a concrete response, springing from God, to the challenges of those calamitous times, and nothing was better suited to that end than offering an education inspired by the values of the gospel, which would serve to counteract the evil and corrupting teaching that was causing so much damage. In the first school rules we read, being one of the means which the Institute employs in order to attain the end proposed, which is reparation of the offenses done to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, free education to poor girls, promoting by this means at the same time the good of souls of those most in need, should be held in great esteem by all those who are called to this congregation, so much so that it should not be omitted except for very serious reasons, but rather they should endeavor that day by day increases. The spirit of reparation is what creates, from the beginning, the multiplicity of forms of teaching and apostolates. It was the spirit of reparation which, focusing on the restoration of the image of God within the human soul, channeled its operations into education. It created the multiplicity of forms of teaching and apostolate. Not only must education take place in academies and schools, but also in catechesis and institutes of higher learning. The spirit of reparation has created a veritable educational cycle a chain of linked institutions. It has been the constant motive of the never satisfied longing to have academies and schools at the highest level possible. We have to keep in mind that if our education is to be an expression of our reparative charism which we hold as an inheritance, it must have a very unique character, that which God and the Church have desired for our congregation. Like good treasure hunters, we are called to discover the gift within each person, to find the fountain of life that springs from each human heart, and to foster his or her abilities so that the new woman or man in Christ can flourish. Drawing each unique and irreplaceable person to Christ was a special concern of Saint Raphaela, because every soul has cost the blood of God himself. There is no pedagogy more current, more active, and more personalized. 2. Our first writings. We have at times asked ourselves if the Institute, throughout its history, has developed its own educational style. Upon reviewing the extant sources and documents we can definitely answer in the affirmative. Our pedagogy began in the year 1878, when our first free school was opened in Madrid. Our foundresses and the first handmaids left us pedagogical writings and rules which have been handed down to us. Several writings contain interesting educational principles and criteria however, more than anything else, what have been transmitted to us are life experiences born of deep convictions which have permanently marked the educational undertakings of the Institute. From the beginnings, they tried to work out the hows, the whys were already clear for them. Their pedagogy was born of J. God's pedagogy, which is the pedagogy of love. For this reason their fundamental development, as we will see in depth further on, was the pedagogy of the heart. After having analyzed and gathered some facts from our history, we have been able to confirm how greatly esteemed education was from the beginnings of our institute. Education does not hold a secondary place with us. Far from it, said Mother Sacred Heart, although it was at times for her an object of worry, since she feared that the busy activity of the academies might undermine the exposition of the Blessed Sacrament. She was firmly convinced that the apostolic power of the institute had its origin in the Eucharist. May God grant that we do the right thing as far as education, 
and that it be possible for us to accommodate it in such a way that the blessed sacrament does not suffer. To Mother Pillar, woman of action, we owe a great deal in the educational field. We cannot but call to mind again that precious letter which is one of the most expressive texts which we have about our vocation as educators. And I can't put into words how my desire for teaching keeps growing, and it even comes to my mind that my sister and I left the Carmelites in order to found a school in Cordoba, and in that we saw, then, the will of God. She considered it important that the centers which were being opened in the various cities should be focal points for the spread of Christian life. If this were not so, the effort of founding was not worth the trouble. Emergent neither here nor in the vicinity is their education offered by sisters, but rather municipal schools. And in this way without religion, I say, why found here without forming these hearts in piety, without which there is no hope. Although our foundresses and their first companions did not have a pedagogical background, they immediately forged relationships with other institutes who shared the same spirituality. The Order of Our Lady and the Society of the Sacred Heart of Jesus aimed their trust because of their long experience in the area of teaching. We also know that they were familiar with the Ratio Studirum, which inspired the first regulations of the Institute. It is logical that this would be the case, since they had already taken the Society of Jesus as their model in every way possible. Our first written document dealing with education is the work of Mother Maria de los Santos Martes, Secretary of Mother Sacred Heart in 1885. It took as a source a document which the French priest Monsieur Bonnard wrote for the religious of the Sacred Heart, Mother Maria de los Santos Martes copied from the text, substituting and altering it with what pertained to the Institute. This document gives us a rich understanding of the foundations of our educational ministry, always lived from the point of view of reparation. Its originality comes from the inspiration, which gives it life, the same inspiration that gives rise to the constitutions. The author indicates the four fundamental characteristics which education in the congregation of reparatrices of the Sacred Heart of Jesus must have and which must be practiced according to the spirit of reparation, which distinguishes the Institute, in order to give a specific response to the call given them by God. The first element indicated is nobility, which corresponds to the supernatural nobility of its object and end, namely, procure in carrying out their charge nothing less than the greatest alleviation and reparation of the offenses which the Sacred Heart of Jesus receives, due mainly to the ignorance about our divine religion which reigns in general. In all education, it is of fundamental importance that it be solid, and so this writing calls for solid piety, solid teaching, solid learning, first of all in what concerns religious instruction. And for that reason, in order to establish the foundation in its truest principles, the statutes places Christian doctrine as the principal study for the girls and the primary objective of the course of studies. But without in any way excluding other types of instruction. Instruction, defined strictly, must be as solid as the religious education. We should prefer in our schools what is useful to what is agreeable. When Mother Maria de los Santos Martes indicates the other two characteristic elements of our education, saying that it has to be discreet and altruistic, in the sense of being freely offered, a characteristic which the Institute has always demonstrated, she is referring as well to the religious themselves who will be teachers, as we see in some truly beautiful paragraphs, to which we will return later. As a work of abnegation as well, education demands not only teachers with knowledge but also mothers who are everything for their daughters, and so everyone, but especially the headmistress of every school must consider herself as a mother to all the girls who are entrusted to her care, who treats their souls with that care and concern with which one handles priceless fragile vessels. We have already seen, as well, the preoccupation of the foundresses, especially Mother Pillar, for the formation and preparation of the sisters who were assigned to teach a, not a strange concern considering the increasing demand for foundations and the scarcity of prepared personnel, which caused the Institute to improvise in the matter of teachers in the beginning. Very soon they felt the need for their own regulations which would delineate in a certain sense the pedagogical guidelines and the organization of schools, that is, a unique educational style. Almost all were inspired by those of other institutes. The oldest regulations we have are those sent by Mother Sacred Heart to her sister Pillar in Rome in 1886 with the title of School Rules, taken in large part from the Society of the Sacred Heart, and in which there were also some rules taken from the Order of Our Lady. It is to these rules that St. Raphael refers in the following letters. 
In these last letters, I included, as you will have seen, a rule for the school headmistress and her subordinate. It is taken from the Sacred Heart Sisters. I like it and it seemed apropos, and that's why I sent it. I also sent you the rule, very detailed for school teachers as the religious of the Sacred Heart have. When the first academy began in La Coruña, they felt the need to know other regulations. Mother Sacred Heart takes on the role of finding them, despite the serious fears she had about this new foundation. I sent those two regulations, tomorrow I will send more from the English sisters and from the girls in Leganese. Although many concrete details and orientations of our centers have, when compared to those first writings and norms, changed and adapted to new times and places, we have to remember with fondness the educational history that our foundress has transmitted to us, one which has continued in its development and meaningfulness up to the present day. In the present, the same educational heart continues to beat and launches us forward to new pedagogical challenges. It is this common spirit that still gives us life on the journey toward the future as we respond to the needs of the times and the advances in human knowledge. 3. Our education is in service of the gospel. Education in service of the gospel, as the apostolic activity of the Institute, is not merely a commitment for us, but something much deeper. It is part of our very identity, our reparative charism, and from the beginnings it had a preferential focus, the concern for the small and weak. The apostolic activity proper to our Institute is education in service of the gospel. It includes promoting human development, announcing the gospel message, and helping people to internalize their faith, both as individuals and as members of a community. According to this premise, the integral growth of the person must necessarily traverse the path traced in the gospel, one which leads to a commitment to Jesus Christ. What importance education and service of the gospel has? It is an option for Jesus Christ and his reign. It is an option to accompany the life of others in their human Christian personal social and fraternal lives. Our foundresses were very sensitive to the realities of their environment and soon realized the importance that education could have in making the reign of God present in the world. They understood well that evangelization, if it seeks to communicate a Christian experience, must be very attentive, above all, to the smallest and weakest, in order to collaborate, just as General Congregation Roman 14 would say, to establish Christ's reign in a new society that is just and caring. This education in service of the gospel includes the values we want to transmit as well as the attitudes that educators must have, and also the knowledge that must be imparted. This demands that the educational community keep in mind that there is little value in our announcing the gospel if we do not live it. Evangelization is done in community. We are a community in and for mission. We accomplish it to the extent that we live as a loving community. The community as such has a role of evangelization to fulfill, namely, to offer the message it announces already made flesh in its own life. The backbone of our education is our altruistic love for the students. Only from this stance are we able to give valid responses and discuss other lifestyles and ways of being in the world. For us, this education in service of the gospel has been at the same time specific and universal, responding with fidelity to our charism to the calls of the church and the challenges of various contexts in different times and places. Truly it is a great gift with which to serve humanity today, to be educators and keepers of the mission of education in service of the gospel. From this mission we understand that educating is repairing and evangelizing. With education in service of the gospel according to the style of Saint Raffaella Maria we work for the transformation of the world, through transformation of the heart of the person. Within education in service of the gospel, the Institute has given special emphasis to education in the faith, understood in its connection with a comprehensive education that develops every dimension of the human person. 3.1. Education in the Faith Our foundresses soon perceived that educational centers were an especially useful and strategic platform for faith education. They strove using every means at their disposal to make that message of salvation take root in the lives of their students. They had an intuition that was born of the Spirit, one which the Church would confirm years later. In fact the proclamation only reaches full development when it is listened to, accepted and assimilated, and when it arouses a genuine adherence in the one who has thus received it. Catechesis was the first educational task to which they dedicated themselves, and it was always their desire to offer this apostolic service. 
From the beginnings, with the means they had available, they gave high priority to this activity, calling for a special diligence on the part of those who would provide it. It is remarkable that they would apply the limited pedagogical resources available to them in order to achieve through catechesis the objectives they had in mind. The foundations of a person's education are laid in the first few years, and for this reason, in order to form the students as good Christians it is recommended that our catechesis be the best prepared, the best given because of the love with which it is given and the clarity with which it is explained, that it be what concerns us most. Every handmaid should be an excellent catechist. Many years later, the Institute would insist on the importance of catechesis in our apostolate of evangelization, understanding that a good catechesis, in addition to the knowledge it imparts, ought to make a connection with liturgical, sacramental celebrations. In our task of education in service of the gospel, catechesis has an important role to play because by means of it we collaborate in the formation of the new person in Christ. From the beginning we try to help the person discover the calls that God makes to each of us at every moment of our lives in order to respond freely to them. We try to have these responses lead to a commitment of life within the church as a personal choice for service of God's reign. In the whole process of catechesis, it is fundamental to reveal the value of the Eucharist so that each person lives it, shares in it and becomes a committed Christian. In our centers, we have never considered faith education as a compendium of abstract facts, haphazardly imparted and disconnected from life. Doubtless, it was because of this concern that in 1958 the Institute of Sacred Studies Lux Vera came into being in La Coruña. From Vatican Roman II onwards, all handmaids were urged to become qualified to carry out the specific tasks necessary for faith education. In order that the educators may carry out their task of education in faith, an effort must be made to train and prepare all of them pastorally and catechetically, bearing in mind that besides special gifts extremely careful preparation and a constant readiness to begin anew to adapt are required. Today, in a social and religious context that is quite different, from the perspective of respect for our students, but with the same seriousness with which the other subjects are taught, religious education in our schools continues to hold an important place in our centers. It endeavors to respond to the great existential questions with which the person is confronted. It contributes to the formation of a critical and committed attitude with regard to society. It allows us to offer the students the possibility of considering their very existence according to the gospel. We have always wanted our students to be able to arrive at a profound understanding of what must be decisive and important for their Christian lives. Attitudes that spring from the gospel and therefore from our educational mission. The overall atmosphere of the center and the attitude of its educators can be considered either positive or negative influences in faith education. From this perspective, it is important that all of the staff of the center, aware of their mission as educators in faith and of the value of personal and community witness, should through their lives and words foster the Holy Spirit's action in the pupils. We know that religious formation goes far beyond the task of religious instruction, although it includes it and completes it. However, the atmosphere provided, and above all the educators themselves, are the element that most strongly affects faith education, as we have seen. A Christian educator has to awaken questions and propose certain truths, and has to be able to accompany these questions and truths and discern them, but above all, must be sure of the power of the gospel to make her work fruitful and believe in the significance of her mission. This presupposes a commitment that is consistent with the demands of what the educator lives and announces. Where there is ambiguity, there is no meaningful witness. 3.2. Education in certain values. An education is not necessarily Christian simply because it is saturated with Christian symbolism. It is Christian if it corresponds to a set of gospel values that involves an understanding of the human person. It is the responsibility of the educational center to openly declare its values in order to respectfully offer them as a possibility for its students to freely choose. The Gospel of Jesus is our reference for values. These values give life and create harmonious connections between the human person and nature, the person herself himself, others, and God. Education is an excellent way to offer formation in values, in which the person and her or his rights and responsibilities occupy a central place. In its long educational trajectory, the Institute has always promoted certain values and attitudes that spring from the Gospel and therefore belong to our charism as well. 
there are many implicit references to values found in our early writings. Although it is true that in the beginnings, these values were not formulated in a systematic manner, this in no way indicates that they were absent from our educational process. The handmaids place emphasis on those gospel values, present in our charism, that promote maturation in Christian faith development. These values accentuate the characteristics unique to our vocation. Their source is the Eucharist, which is the center of the life of the handmaids of the Sacred Heart. We opt for an education in which the person is considered a child of God, and this impels us to conceive of education as a liberating process and allows us to be open to diversity, to be peacemakers and reconcilers, and to promote justice. From an attitude of solidarity, we try to foster the development of a society that is more human and more Christian. To build with others a world that is more humane, where fraternity, justice and reconciliation prevail, we consider love the fundamental attitude that we want to promote. Today it continues to be a goal for handmade educators to guide students so that they become capable of making responsible choices that will lead them to commit themselves to the degree possible considering their different circumstances to certain values which give meaning to their lives. In a society like our own, it is fundamental for us to educate in freedom and for freedom, so that our students acquire a clear and authentic concept of what freedom implies and choose to take on concrete responsibilities. All of our educational plans currently insist also on the duty we have to educate in justice and solidarity. Stimulating critical reflection on the situations of injustice which exist in our society, so that the students do not let themselves be manipulated or become accomplices to injustice through silence or indifference. In a world torn apart by so many types of violence, in accordance with our charism of repair of breaches, our educational mission drives us to work for the promotion of justice in love, in solidarity with those who are deprived of their rights, work to re-establish that peace and reconciliation which Christ brought us, proclaim with our life and apostolic action that in Jesus Christ, the revelation of God the Father, the deepest and ultimate meaning of human life can be found, as well as the drive to build a world that is more just and caring. It is important to awaken the consciences of our students so that they become defenders of these values, first in the environment in which they live, so that later they may be able to collaborate in the context of the larger human community to create an authentic experience of being brothers and sisters. Our educational activity in promoting values is always directed toward real life and the future. We are obligated to educate in this way, because our education springs from a dynamic and creative charism, as we have been demonstrating throughout this volume. Situations change and fixed solutions can become outdated and even useless. However, if we are able to develop gospel attitudes in our students, we will have made it possible that today in their classrooms, and tomorrow in their professional lives, they will be able to dedicate themselves, from love and justice, liberty and peace, too see the reality that surrounds them and discover the message hidden in each situation. Go deeper into the respect for and dealings with countries and people who are in more vulnerable situations. Reach out to the suffering, the abandoned, and the poor. Choose always what is right and just, with responsibility and freedom, and without allowing themselves to be swayed by anyone. An education in values cannot be measured by academic success, but rather by quality of life, the life which develops within the person and the life of her or his relationships with others. Values are the center of our pedagogy, and for that reason must stimulate the apostolic activity of our educational communities. If we wish to follow the style of Rafaela Maria and of so many other sisters of our congregation who have given their lives to the work of education, we like them must give ourselves to the mission, because it is our inheritance passed down to us. With our gaze on Christ in the Eucharist, we will continue on our path in simplicity, hope, and boldness in order to serve, better and more fully, in our commitment to the future.